Welcome again to our class on the Scholars class here at the Cathedral of Valor. We have spent the first few classes on establishing the fact that the Bible is the only book that God ever inspired. It is the most unique book that has ever been written. And I'm not going to go back over all of that, but let us just remind ourselves that there is no other book that has fulfilled predictive prophecy, is accurate in what it says, its archaeology is sound, it changes lives that nothing else can change. It was written over 1,500 years on three different continents in three different languages dealing with dozens of controversial subjects and there's complete harmony. And when you synthesize that, there's not another book in the world that can match it. So we hold that the Bible is the only book inspired of God. And that's why I have it here. The Bible inspired of the Holy Spirit, because the scriptures say all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction into what is right. It also says in First Peter, or excuse me, Second Peter, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We then went to show that Jesus Christ was the only answer to man's problem of being broken, self-destructive, and sinful. And we will not go back over that. But we will just touch on the fact that it is impossible to have all of the physical prophecies in the Old Testament that dealt with the coming Messiah, that were fulfilled in the life of Jesus, that were not fulfilled in any other person of history. That Jesus Christ's claim was to be God in the flesh, he died on the cross in our place, was buried, rose again the third day with true and viable witnesses, he had one of his disciples stick his finger in the hole inside of his wrist, stick his hand up his side, and said, Be not faithless, but believing. So we hold that Jesus Christ is the salvation of man. Now we're going to go through and start comparing the Bible to the teachings of different organizations. And we're going to answer the question of why we are Protestants and not Roman Catholics in this lesson today. I have produced a series of scriptures for this outline that have it there for the sake of the camera so that we're not waiting for people to look up references. They're up there on that little ledge that says scriptures for lesson four. And if you don't have one, please get one. Now, I'm going to just use a pen since I didn't bring my laser pointer. All right? We have here a statement which stands the test of time. And that is, in essentials, unity. And the one thing in which all Christians are united is Jesus Christ and Him crucified buried, and raised again. If somebody says they are Christian and does not believe that Jesus Christ is God, come in the flesh, died on the cross in our place, was buried, and rose again the third day, and ascended back to heaven, and is coming back for us, whether he, he or she says they're Christian or not, according to the Bible, they're not. You cannot deny the essential truth of the Christian faith on our founder and then claim to be in the Christian faith. In non-essentials, liberty. And that means your walk with God. There is not a one-size-fits-all expression of the Christian faith among God's people. 
we dealt with why are there so many translations of scripture, for example. Well, there are that many languages to begin with. And the Bible is still being translated into additional languages. Why are there so many translations in English? Because they are addressed to different demographics. Some people don't read really well beyond uh, sixth, seventh grade level. So there are Bibles that are accurate that deal with that. There are others that want a scholarly, thick, rich translation with study notes, and so there are translations for that. Is there one translation that is perfect that God inspired? No. We are told he inspired the originals. We are never promised in scripture that there is an inspired translation, superior to all others. That's why particularly in modern times, there will be updates to translations, and there will be new translations that will take the information from older ones, pool them, to come up with the most accurate expression that can be made as to what God was saying in the Bible. And finally, in all things charity. Charity is the word that the King James translators used for the Greek word agape, which is love. And that love is not a love that depends upon somebody loving you back. That love depends strictly on your internal motivation to be a blessing to something and someone you value. In a lot of ways, the closest that we can get to it is a mother's love for a helpless infant. That infant to whom she has given birth is going to be nothing but work, and responsibility for years. And yet there is such an overwhelming love that you pour yourself into those infants when they can't do anything back for a long time, except sleep. That's the closest thing we have for a God they love. Fathers can feel this too, but not in the same way that a mother can. Then, we're going to go into the scriptures now of 1 Thessalonians 5.21 and Acts 16, 11, and 12. That's not in the packet, but that is in your scripture. I'll just quote 1 Thessalonians 5.21. It's easy. This now is what we are going to do, commanded to us by apostolic authority. The Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse... 19, uh, 21. Starting in verse 21, I think, gives some short, emphatic commands. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Which is great. We can hold fast to that which is good, but how do we prove it? He doesn't tell us there. Because it's told to us before in the book of Acts. And this I will have John read, if you would please, Acts 16, 11 and 12, nice and loud for the camera. 16, what? Acts 16, 11 and 12. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and next, the next day came to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city in the part of Macedonia and a colony, and we were staying in that city for some days. That's not it. <laughs> uh, very clearly. All right. Let me look it up because I've got it underlined in mine. Excuse me. Acts 17, 11 and 12. I'm wrong. It was 17. So this up here is wrong. Now read it, please. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. Yeah. In that they receive the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. All right. These were more noble than they in Thessalonica. In that they heard the word of God with all readiness of mind, but searched the scriptures daily whether these things are so. And that's what we are going to do with this class. We are going to search the scriptures, whether the things are so that we have been told are Christian teachings. I'm going to adjust this so that it 
will make sense. And just excuse me for about another 30 seconds. Thank you. All right, Acts 17, 11 and 12. We are going to now start with our roots. We have before us, in the writings of the Holy Bible, the teachings of the apostles of the first century. And we have access to teachings at the tail end of the first century going into the second century with which to compare that were not of apostolic origin. One is the Epistle of Barnabas. Two, the Epistle of Clement to Rome. Three is the Shepherd of Hermas. And four is the Didache. We're not going to go into detail with those, but trust me when I say this, that you can buy them, you can read them, and you will know that they are not scripture. Because, for example, uh, the Epistle of Barnabas makes the statement that rabbits have so many young because they have two sets of reproductive organs in their bodies. I've actually read that, and no, they don't. Clement goes into a five-chapter description of the phoenix, saying where its nesting sites were, what its migratory patterns were, the fact that after five years it actually would explode in flame and from the ashes would come up a new bird. We know that that is myth. The shepherd of Hermas talks about a shepherd that is presented with a beautiful young woman getting up out of the river, stark naked, and turning around and smiling at him, and then him struggling with thoughts of lust, and then she suddenly turning into an angel and rebukes him for his thoughts of lust, and then starts leading him on into a disciplined Christian life, and a lot of the disciplines that she leads him to are not found in Scripture. And finally, the Didache, which almost made it into the Bible. And it, was, it is still to this day billed as the traditions, the oral traditions of the apostles. If you read it with a knowledge of Scripture, you can see where the things that the Didache says do not line up with Scripture. And rather than to bog us all down with proving that the writing of the New Testament stopped with the death of the apostle John, by taking those four documents and showing that they are not inspired of the Holy Spirit, we're going to move on from that and go into how the church developed over time. All of us that claim the name of Jesus Christ came originally from Roman Catholicism. And there are a number of people that are hearing this and are saying, <laughs> I don't think so. But actually you did. Historically, the Roman government and the church embroidered themselves together. But you're absolutely right when you think, but there were these severe persecutions. And there were. The reality is that the church became the social safety net of the Roman world. Abandonment was practiced on children that were not wanted, infants that were not wanted. And there were practicing Christians that would rescue those children and put them into Christian families to be raised. There were plagues that took place in the ancient Roman world. And during the plagues, everybody that had money and could scooted out back to their estates in the country. The church stayed and ministered to the poor, ministered to the sick, and helped them. And over centuries, this giving, sacrificial giving, won the hearts of the people. And eventually, the government came to rely on the church to do these things. Then, when Constantine issued the Edict of Milan and said that Christians could practice without persecution, and their buildings were giving back to them, and they were accepted like any other religion in the Roman world. They became even more wedded because Constantine considered himself a Christian. And I understand the history of it, that he was baptized basically on his deathbed, and that he still did not do away with 
the worship of the Caesar and his title of Pontificus Maximus, which the Pope still claims today. But he did more to establish Christianity in the Roman world than all the other Caesars before him, and a lot of the ones after him. So there was this union between government and church that just worked. We have Constantine to thank for 50 perfect copies of the scriptures. He told his secretary, Eusebius, that for the churches, take the writings of the Bible, their sacred scriptures, I want 50 perfect copies for the churches in my governmental domain. And Eusebius did that. And that was the first time that the teachings of the apostles and the prophets came under one cover. That's 300 plus years after the birth of Jesus. What language? I'm sorry? What language was it written in? Actually, it was written originally in Greek. It was not translated into Latin until the gentleman named Jerome did it. And I think he started at 485, and I think he passed away before that translation was done. And those that followed him, because he was a monk, and he was a brilliant monk, but nobody really got along with him well. That's one of the reasons why he was a monk. <laughs> but he was brilliant, and he translated the Greek scriptures and the Hebrew scriptures, both of which he could read, into the Latin, because the dominant language of the world at the end of the 400s, of the Western world anyways, was... Latin. Greek have more or less migrated to the other side of the Bosporus Strait, and those that know your geography know that that's basically where Constantinople was located. Constantinople in the Christian church stayed Greek. Rome in the Western church went to Latin. But it was translated originally by Eusebius into Greek, because Greek was still the dominant language at that time. So what the church did when they got this Bible as they started comparing what the teachings of the Bible said about what they had done for 300 years without the Bible. It was like having 300 years of American government without the Constitution. Everybody was doing the best they could, but you really didn't know. In this case, they didn't know. They were attacked by heresies. They were attacked by persecution. They were attacked from within, from without. You could be martyred for having any kind of writings of the Bible in your possession until Constantine, and many were. There were false documents rolling around out there, claiming to be scripture. There were other people that set up their own Bibles. The first actual combination of writings of the New Testament in one volume was by a guy named Marcion who happened to be a raging heretic. And what he did was he said that Luke's gospel was the only one that was right, and the writings of Paul were the only ones inspired. And so he made his first New Testament out of Luke and the writings of Paul. Everything else he chucked. The church didn't agree with him. They tried to deal with him, and found out that he also believed that the Old Testament God was a separate God from the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that he was a mean, vindictive God, and that Jesus came to reveal the loving, true God, who did not happen to be his father. The church rebuked him, told him to quit. He didn't. So he was excommunicated. What the church did then, they took the teachings of the Bible that were given to them by Eusebius and compared it to what they had been doing. And rather than do what ultimately should have been the right decision, start over from scratch, from here, and do it right, they instead looked for some kind of cover in the Bible for what they had already done. They didn't want to do away with what they had already done, and so they looked for scriptures to support it. Nobody likes to be proved wrong. And they didn't either. And if the Bible came out and said that something that they did was wrong, they would try to massage it and compare it to other things and stretch it a little bit to where it fit. And the Christian church continued to do that for centuries. 
centuries. Until finally, they didn't even deal with the scriptures. The Council of Toulouse in the 1200s forbade the reading and teaching of the Bible, and instead mandated that the homily of the Mass was to be on papal teaching, and made it a crime to translate the Bible into the vernacular language. This decision was reaffirmed in the 1500s at the Council of Trent, and was only removed at the Vatican II Council in the 1960s. So that now there are many Roman Catholic translations of the Dewey Reims Bible in different languages. That's just the brief history of the church. They didn't want people looking at the church, comparing it with the scriptures, and then saying, wait a minute, this ain't right. If you read the Bible yourself, you can prove the preacher or the priest up on the <laughs> altar who is giving you garbage. And you can't do that because they're a prince of the church. And there is that. They are a prince of the church. They are, the Roman Catholics believe, and we will get to this, that the priesthood is in direct descendants from the apostles and carry their same authority. So to say that a priest was wrong was to say that the apostles were wrong. And that's just, I mean, they burned him at the stake for that. And did. What we are going to do, what we are blessed with, is what we have read in Acts 17, 11. We will receive the word of God with all readiness, but we will search the scriptures whether these things be so. We are limiting this search to the 66 books of the Protestant Bible. We are not going to go into the Apocrypha unless we get to the study of Purgatory, which is a separate handout for that, in which Purgatory's sole scriptural support comes from 2 Maccabees. That was not accepted as scripture until the Council of Trent in the 1500s. Now, to illustrate this, what we're going to do is we're going to take Roman Catholicism, its teachings, some of its history, and its practices. We're going to run them through a Bible filter with these three tests. There should be two or more occurrences. You cannot build a doctrine on a single occurrence in the Bible. This was established way back under Moses when God said, the testimony of one will not be sufficient. Two or more witnesses are needed in order to, pro in order to prove truth. So we will do that. Makes sense. There should be further apostolic teaching on it. If something is important as a doctrine, the apostles inspired of the Holy Spirit, will address it somewhere. And finally, if there's only one occurrence, and if there's no further apostolic teaching, then we look to see if it harmonizes with and doesn't contradict known scripture. If the apostles are silent on it, if the New Testament is silent on it, and the church has embraced it, then we will compare that with Scripture, to see if the scriptures say that, yes, this is okay, it doesn't really make a difference, it's a non-essential, you have liberty, or whether they have something clearly in the Bible that says, no, don't do that. Finally, it is, I'll just, you know, spoiler alert, if you want to call it that, when you take the teachings of Roman Catholicism, run it through the Bible filter of these three tests, you will end up seeing, at least, why the Protestants came into existence. You are still free. Anybody that is listening to this that happens to be an observant, practicing Roman Catholic, none of this is to dispute the expression of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The only purpose, and we'll pick on Protestant churches too, because they're easy to pick on but the only purpose for this one is to run the teachings of Roman Catholicism because they are the largest Christian denomination in the world. They have been the largest Christian denomination in the world for centuries. 
run it through the Bible, and then see what we get. Roman, practicing Roman Catholic priests named Martin Luther, John Calvin, other names that we could go into, Holbrook Zwingli, uh, Luther Blaurock, and others whom you probably don't even know about, did this path. And the reason they did that is another piece of history. For those of you that know your history, Constantinople, the last Christian kingdom of the world in the 1450s, was conquered by the Seljuk Turks. Whenever the Turks took over a Christian enclave, they destroyed everything of Christian, they destroyed the libraries, they destroyed the iconography, they changed the churches into either mosques, or in one case, into a stable, where horses and stuff could simply empty themselves onto the church floor, and they would just clean it up. So the scholars that were in Constantinople could see the writing on the wall. They knew this was coming. So they scooped up all those good Greek manuscripts that they had kept since the days of Constantine, and they scooted over to the Latin West. When Constantinople fell, most, if not all, of the Christian and pagan, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, landed in the Christian West. And people started comparing. These scholars had this, all this good, fresh material. And so they started comparing the Greek Bible to the Latin Bible. And they found out, oops, oops there are differences here. So, what do we do? That was decided by a guy named Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam, up in the Dutch Netherlands. He took the Greek manuscripts that he was given. A lot of them were incomplete simply because they had been destroyed for age. I mean, they were written on perishable material. These things have been around for a thousand years. How many think that you could keep a newspaper for a thousand years and that you could still read it and handle it like you could in the first year? Well, well, that was a little more stable. Than well, they were, but it illustrates the point. <laughs> yeah. well, the the ones, that lasted, the ones that lasted the longest were those that were on vellum, which was a leather. But most of them were still written on parchment, which was perishable. Uh, just was. Parchment is sheepskin. Parchment was stronger than paper, but it was not as strong as vellum. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Coming from a art historical background. Uh, sure. Papyrus is pressed leaves. Yes. Okay. But my understanding that the parchment and vellum were sheepskin. Parchment was linen. Okay. Vellum was sheepskin. At least the parchments that I have read about. Now there may have been something called parchment that was made out of leather that I don't know anything about because I don't know everything. And if anybody ever thinks I do, let me tell you now. I don't! <laughs> But what I do know, I present to you. And I'm not making this up because I'm not drawing any disciples after me. I'm not going to ask you for an offering. I'm not asking you to buy my works. There's no incentive for me to do this, okay, except that I want to get truth out where it belongs, into the marketplace. But maybe in agreement with what you said, Martin Luther said the same thing when he stood up at the diets. I am only a man and not God. He did say that. And we'll get into Luther at the Diet of Worms eventually as well. So we're going to take, at this point, Roman Catholicism, run it through these three biblical tests, and see where the Protestants came from. You are not obligated to forsake Roman Catholicism for the Protestant faith. As long as you hold that your faith is not in the graces of the church, is not when a priest said, Ego te absolvo, when a priest absolves your sins. But your faith is in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross as your substitute for sin and raised from the dead as your hope for the future. Then, there's a richness to the Roman Catholic faith, properly understood, that you're not going to get in the Protestant faith. But there are also some things that the Bible does not support. And as long as you enter into it with your eyes open, we're not going to say that you're damned and going to hell. The 
only thing that will put someone in hell that has heard the gospel is they don't believe it. If you place your faith in any man-made institution, including this class, and not in the finished work of Jesus Christ, you are not saved from your sins, and you will still pay for them under a just God who will righteously consign you to hell. Yes? The fact that you admit or acknowledge that Roman Catholics are Christian is a, a blessing because there are, <laughs> there are Christian churches who say that Catholics are not Christian. And that is true. My people are disturbed for lack of knowledge, and not having that knowledge will destroy any chance of unity in the church. The Let me is. establish this <laughs> biblically, then. The Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, said, This is the gospel that I preach. This, right here. That Christ died, according to the scriptures, in fulfillment of the scriptures, was buried, and was raised again the third day, according to the scriptures. And faith in him is your salvation. Faith in the graces of the church, faith in the authority of the Pope, in the authority of the bishops, is not what saves you. It will be what disciples you, but it is not what saves you. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Period. And we need to establish that. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is essential. Cannot do away with that. Then, in your walk with God, how you express that is between you and the Lord. And there's scriptures that support that. Now, having said all that, we're going to get to the study outline and the scriptures for it. And in this study outline, we're going to take eight defining characteristics of Roman Catholicism. There are quite obviously are more than eight defining characteristics. I've done a ninth over there about purgatory that I have not done in this one. But eight, and particularly eight plus purgatory, are sufficient to take Roman Catholic teaching, run it through a Bible filter, and see where the Protestants came from. All right. Underneath Protestants, just real quick, there are basically three groups of Protestants. Lutherans, under Martin Luther. Calvinists under John Calvin, Armenians under Jacob Arminius, and then Pentecostals, which cover it all. And we'll get to that part too. So now you understand why this board is designed the way it is. All right. These are the eight defining characteristics of these in a sequential basis. One, the primacy of the Pope, the Bishop of Rome. Two, devotion to Mary the mother of Jesus, co-mediatrix, and co-redemptrix. It's not in there, John. There's a second one up there. It looks like this. Okay. Three, a celibate priesthood. Celibate simply means an unmarried priesthood, and that also includes unmarried monks and unmarried nuns. Four, sacred tradition is equal to Scripture. Five, transubstantiation. Six, apostolic succession in the priesthood. Seven, the gospel and salvation. Eight, the seven sacraments. And as I mentioned before, nine, purgatory. So, the biblical test for the establishment of a cardinal doctrine of the church, there has to be scriptural support. And in descending order, they are expressed here, Two of the three should be present, but if one of the three is present, and particularly number three, that it harmonizes with and doesn't contradict known scripture, then it can be embraced. Not as an essential, but as a liberty that we are free to absorb. Yes? And this test came from, you said, from Moses or from the Old Testament? This, these three, this three tests came from the book of, which book? Is, was it Deuteronomy, Exodus, or which? Oh! It didn't, this test it did not come from any of the books of the Bible. This test came from a distilled 
reading of the tests that were used to establish which books were put into the Bible to begin with, and then tests after that that the church used in order to establish a doctrine and a truth. It does not occur at any one spot. That is my irreducible minimum of what the church did after the apostles. Yes. I think he's referring to the Mosaic Law that you mentioned that you needed two witnesses. Two or three witnesses for every word to be established? Yes. That, I think that's oh, that's I thought true. you were talking about the three tests up there. The, that was the two witnesses was, was one of them. Yeah, exactly. As I was referring to be honest to with you, I don't know exactly where that is. I didn't no think problem. to look it up, but I will okay. find it. And right the people on the camera, I'll get that out no for you next time. All right. These are the three tests that the two or more occurrences in Scripture, because of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. I can give you one for that right now. Matthew 18. Turn there. Guys. All right, starting in verse Matthew 18, 17, 16, excuse me. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And that particular reference is in Deuteronomy 19, 15. Thank you for that. I should have done that a little bit just... Mistakes happen. All right, we're going to get to the primacy of the Pope. Now, in your scriptures, if you are here, you will see that I have given you the scriptures with the outlines, and they are Matthew 16, 13 through 20, Mark 8, 27 through 30, Luke 9, 18 through 21. And I have all three of them here on the first page. What I want to point out is that there's only one reference in the entire New Testament that says, upon this, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You will look at the same thing in Mark, where it says, verse 29, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. And he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. The statement about, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, doesn't occur anywhere else in the entire New Testament. And you are free, put the call in Acts 17 and 11 on me, and let's search the scriptures whether these things be so. I'm not perfect, I make mistakes, but I am convinced with a concordance and with study Bibles and with 45 years of Christian study that this is the only reference, and that's in Matthew only. So it fails the first test. There's not two or more occurrences. What he said in Matthew 16, we're going to deal with, because he said, and I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. That is repeated in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 21 through 23. But it is not addressed to Peter. It says here, so Jesus said to them, plural, again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you, and in the Greek, that is plural. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you, plural, again, retain the sins of any, they are retained. So we have apostolic ability equal to Peter. Peter was not separated for that power in any other gospel except Matthew. And the Greek is different, Petra versus Petros. I don't know how many of you might have seen Indiana Jones on the Last Crusade when they go into that big uh, cliff worship center to go after the Holy Grail. That's Petra. Huge, big, 
rock. Petros meant stone. And Peter, in his epistle, and we're going to get to that in the next page, where he mentions stone and cornerstone four separate times in 1 Peter 2, 1 through 9, and he never mentions himself as being it. All right, we're moving on next to Matthew 17, 1 through 7, which is the transfiguration. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up high on the mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out from the cloud of God the Father speaking audibly and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces. They were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And we are going to follow what the Father said. We're going to hear what Jesus says. And not necessarily anything that people say that Jesus said, or take what Jesus said and stretch it to cover something that was already established historically in the Christian church by the 300s. Part of the claim of the Pope is that he is the vicar of Christ. Vicar is where we get the word vicarious, which means that's touching everything. And it's not based on any New Testament scripture. It's actually based, if you want to go into the Roman Catholic teaching, they base it on the kingdom of David. That they state that when David was out fighting wars and doing what David did, that he had a vicar that stayed back in the kingdom and ran things in his absence. And that's what they hold the Pope is, running things on this earth while Jesus is up there. You can look through the entire Old Testament, and you will never find that office described by anybody. We assume that is true because it makes logical sense, but it doesn't occur in the Bible at all. Maybe Constantine had something to do with that. Yeah, well, yeah, was you know, a lot of things. <laughs> when they already had the primacy of the Bishop of Rome, because the Roman government was interwoven at that time with the uh, Roman Church, it made sense to find some kind of cover so that they could leave that particularly wonderful working relationship in place. And so they went back there and said, well, it makes sense, so it's got to be right. But again, you don't find it in the Bible. You can logically deduce that, but it's not expressed in the Bible anywhere. One of the things that also the Bishop of Rome says is that he has the power of Peter to retain sins, to remit sins, to bestow indulgences from the merits of the apostles, the prophets, and the saints of the church that were not used up in their lifetimes. He has the power to remit sins over those that are in purgatory. And that power was never taken by a Roman pontiff until the 1100s. As a matter of fact, the first, the very beginnings of the Roman Catholic Church are normally historically listed under Gregory the Great in the late 500s, where we get Gregorian chant. He is considered the first Roman pontiff, pontifus, pontificus maximus. And he stated in his writings, his pastoral writings, he was a great writer, and said that any bishop that sets himself up as lord of all other bishops is not the bishop of Christ, but is the forerunner of the Antichrist. And yet 500 years later, that's exactly what was established under the Unum Sanctum. 
where that particular Roman Pope said that if any is not subject to the Roman Pontiff, they are eternally lost and still in their sins. Somebody's got a big ego. And, you know, my son here brought up about Martin Luther. That's why Martin Luther said what he did at his last stand at the Diet of Worms. He said, unless I am convinced by logic, clear logic, and holy scripture, for I trust, for I believe not in popes and consuls, for they have contradicted each other and have been wrong. My conscience is captive to the word of God. And to go against conscience is neither right nor good. I cannot, I will not recant a single thing I have written. Here I stand. I could do no other. God help me. And the Protestant Reformation was born. His statement was undeniable truth that popes and councils contradicted each other, warred against each other, and you could throw into that same mix the uh, Holy Roman Emperor who would go against councils and against popes. And they would go against him. And this happened back and forth for centuries. All right. In 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 5, we see what the Bible says, again, Scripture, says about who is the mediator for us, between us and God. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. I like the capitalization. <clears throat> there is not a line in the New Testament that sets up the apostles as mediators to the Christian church. And again, search the scriptures whether these things be so. After the Pope, so actually I'm going to read again one more, Peter writing in his own words in 1 Peter 2, 1 through 9. Coming to him as a living stone. He's saying that this is the believer's position. You come to Jesus as a living stone. That living stone was rejected indeed by men, but was chosen by God and precious. You also, plural, as living stones, plural, are built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Just verse 5. Believers are living stones. We are a holy priesthood. All believers are a holy priesthood. Do they always live up to that? No. But we are designated by God as a holy priesthood. So we have coming to him as a living stone, verse 4. You also as living stones, verse 5. Verse 6. Therefore it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. We know that is Jesus Christ. There again, chief cornerstone without Peter identifying as it. Verse 7. Therefore, to all you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Again, Jesus Christ. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. But you, again, the church to whom he is writing, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a royal priesthood. There is not a royal priesthood separate class. It is a royal priesthood to the whole church. And you can see that in 1 Peter 1.1. For Peter says, Peter is servant of the Lord Jesus Christ to the churches, and he gives a bunch of locations where those churches are. Grace and peace be unto you. He's writing to the churches. He's not writing to a priesthood. For Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to say, I'm writing to all the churches, and because of that, I'm addressing this to all the people in the churches, 
You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Yes? Is this letter to all people, male and female? Yes. Then there is no obstacle to women being priests. There is no obstacle to women being priests Not before God. Women, but there are conditions where women have been recognized in every ministry except to be a senior pastor of a church. There is not one listed woman who was senior pastor of a church. And so we hold that since the Bible doesn't get that, that a woman cannot be a senior pastor of the church. However, women have been named with the apostles. Women, Peter's wife, traveled with him and worked next to him, was named among the apostles. Women ministers are accepted in the New Testament as a fact. And we'll see that when we get to the discussion on Mary. But no, there is nothing to say that a woman cannot practice a spiritual priesthood before God. There are conditions in the New Testament epistles that state that a woman cannot be a senior pastor of a church and cannot be an archbishop over an entire organization because that's given to us in 1 Timothy and also in Titus that women are not mentioned there. There is a specific statement for that, but other than that, yes, women can be ministers. As a matter of fact, we can go back to the first person that was told to evangelize after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they were all women. The first person to actually physically touch Jesus after the resurrection was a woman. They went and told the apostles, and what did the apostles do? Cowered in the upper room. <laughs> yeah. In the upper room, they were cowering, and they didn't believe them. And then when a couple of guys came in, Jesus walked with these two guys on the road to Emmaus, and they figured out it was him. They said, we've seen the Lord! Nah. It wasn't until Jesus himself appeared to them that they believed. All right. Here, Peter mentions stone and cornerstone five separate times. Never once did he mention it about itself. And this is Peter's epistle. Had that been the primacy of the office of the Bishop of Rome, because that's where Peter was martyred, had been in place under apostolic authority, it would have been mentioned by one of the apostles. It wasn't. So we hold that the Pope is the head of the Roman Catholic Church. Every organization on this planet has got to have a head. There is no problem with recognizing the Pope as the Archbishop over the Cardinals, over the Bishops of the Church, over all the different churches. He's the head. In Protestants, they don't call them Popes, they just call them General Superintendents. Same office, different name. Every organization's got to have a head. Where we draw the line is where the office of the Bishop of Rome accumulated to itself additional spiritual power that it was not given in the Bible. We have an archbishop of this organization. It's my senior pastor, Blaine LaPage. Do I look to him for forgiveness of sins? No. Do I look to him as being Christ's vicar on the earth? No. Do I look to him as being the head of this organization? Yeah. Do I look to him as being senior pastor? Yes. And that's what Roman Catholics can do in clear conscience with the Pope, with the Cardinal, with the priests. Where we draw the line is... 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Period. Before we leave the Pope, I want to finish one more scripture of 2 Peter 2.1. The one I quoted. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He did not call himself the Bishop of Rome. He didn't call himself a vicar. He called himself a bond servant. That's the Greek word doulos, which literally meant a bond slave. He was purchased from the market of sin by the blood of Jesus and served Jesus and his people. The command that was given to Peter specifically after the resurrection when he was restored in John chapter 21 was Simon Son of Jonas. He didn't call him Peter there. It was Simon. Do you love me? 
Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. He did not say rule. He said, feed me. He said it three times there. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. And then he stated, you're going to be martyred like I was. He said, when you were young, you girded yourself and went where you would. But when you were old, others will gird you and carry you where you would not. And he looked at him and said, follow me. Peter knew exactly what he was doing. He didn't like it either because he said, what about John? He said, if I will that he stay until I return, what is that to you? You follow me. Nowhere in that discussion do you have Peter, Prince of the Apostles, ruled the Church of God. It's not there. Peter is never called Prince of the Apostles in the Bible. That was a title that was given to him later by the Church because they were looking for scriptural cover for what they had already established. All right. Now, we go to Mary. And that will be it for today. Mary is the mother of Jesus and Queen of Heaven, co-mediatrix and co-redemptrix. Co-mediatrix means she is co-mediator with Jesus. Co-redemptrix means she is a co-redeemer with Jesus. There are a handful of accepted teachings of Mary. Her Immaculate Conception, her Sinless Life, her going to the Apostle John when Jesus said, Son, behold your mother, mother, behold your son, when he was on the cross. John ended up taking Mary with him when he became senior pastor at the Church of Ephesus, which is in Turkey now. But there is a shrine to Mary in Turkey at this day. My father-in-law has visited it, and I've seen pictures of it. And then there is the Assumption of Mary. The Assumption of Mary holds that when, in keeping with typical Jewish burial ceremonies, they would mummify the corpse. We all know this. I mean, you can see that in what they did with Lazarus. Wrap him, let him go. After a year, when everything had decomposed and it was only bones, they would go back in, bring the corpse up, take the bones out, break them into nice, small, compact things, and then put them in what's called an ossuary. And then that ossuary was buried again. And they did this because they had more people that needed to be buried than they had space to bury them if they were all still mummies. All right, thank you. When they went to do this for Mary, they couldn't find her bones. Matter of fact, the thing was spot clean, according to eyewitness testimonies. Is it possible that she was assumed to heaven? Yes, there's nothing in the Bible that says she couldn't be. Are there things in the Bible that says she could not be the other things that the Bible said, that the church says about her? Yes, and we're going to get to that. In your scriptures, you can see Luke 126 to 48 which is our introduction, basically, to Mary with the angel Gabriel coming to her, the typical Christmas story. And it says, now in the sixth month of the pregnancy of her cousin Elizabeth, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. That is what we now call kind of the Hail Mary. They simply repeat what the angel Gabriel said, and there's not a thing in the world wrong with it. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there would be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I don't know a man? 
And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. We'll just skip down to verse 38 where Mary says, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be unto me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The church teaches that Mary was immaculately conceived. She was conceived without original sin. She did not have a carnal nature in Roman Catholic belief. And they go into some detail as to how that developed. And I don't want to go into that now for the sake of time. I'm already getting flashes that I've got 15 or 10 minutes left. So I won't go into the detail. You can again pull on Acts 17 and 11 and search the scriptures whether these things be so. But Mary is nowhere here in the scriptures stated as immaculately conceived. Right off the bat. There is not even a single occurrence in the Bible. There's no further apostolic teaching in the Bible. And it disagrees with some teaching in the scripture. And I want to get to that disagreement now. One of the teachings of the Roman church is found in Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to read that. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and in her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, basically a hydra, and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them down to earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. The Roman church holds that that is the Virgin Mary. That is the description of her status as the Queen of Heaven. The scriptures, however, in the next one, Genesis 37, 9 through 11, says, this is about Joseph and his dreams. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him, Jacob, and said, what is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall your mother and I, your brothers, indeed come and bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. The idea being that a woman in Joseph's dream that matched the description of the woman in the revelation of John is not the Virgin Mary but the nation of Israel. That is the Bible teaching. Does that mean that God could not have coronated Mary as the Queen of Heaven? No, God can do whatever he chooses. Is that to say that there is a scriptural teaching that wars against that? Yes, and we're going to see more of the war against it after this. Next we're going to see about Immaculate Conception. There's nothing in the scriptures that talk about the Immaculate Conception of Mary. But there is a scripture that has been used by both Roman Catholics and Protestants, found in Psalm 51.5, and it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Psalm 51 is the lament psalm where David is writing about the effects of his affair with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband, Uriah. And he is seeing what caused this in him. And he figured out that it was at his very conception that sin was born in him. For the church to hold that Mary was born without original sin contradicts that Old Testament scripture, a bunch of other Old Testament scriptures which we're going to read now, in Romans 3, 9 through 20. What then? Are we, the Jews, better than they, the Gentiles? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. No exceptions. 
As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They are all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit, the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing, and you can just read the rest of it. We're going to get to verse 19. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped, and that all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh should be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. There are a number of emphatic statements that said there is not a human being since Adam that has not sinned. Whether it records the sin in the Bible or not, all have sinned. No exceptions are given in apostolic teaching. There's nothing in the 66 books of the Protestant Bible that says Mary was born without original sin. It states that, as a matter of fact, at the point of conception, sin is birthed in us. I'm going to just stop here and give a conclusion because we're going to get to the Queen of Heaven, and that's going to take a number of scriptures to read. I'm going to go back to the outline. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is queen of heaven. We've seen she is not. And there's nothing in the scriptures that say she absolutely is not, but there is a line in the scripture that says it's the nation of Israel that is being talked about in Revelation 12, not the Virgin Mary. Is there further apostolic teaching in the epistles about the immaculate conception of Mary, her sinless nature, her perpetual virginity, her death, and her assumption to heaven? There is none. Does it harmonize and, or does it contradict known biblical truth? I have read to you where it contradicts known biblical truth. And there is another scripture that's not in your notes, but it's found in Galatians chapter 4, where it says, When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Jesus was made of a woman. He is the seed of the woman that was prophesied in Genesis 3. Women do not have seed. Biblical Anatomy 101, <clears throat> men have loins, women have wombs, wombs do not have seed. Yes. Loins have seed. But God did a miracle in her so that she conceived as a virgin. Not as a sinless virgin, but as a virgin. And gave birth as a virgin. And that was emphasized in the Gospel of Luke, and Luke was a physician. He knew. Mary conceived Jesus, made of a woman, made under the law. If she is under the law, which Galatians 5 says, then what we read about from Paul in Romans 3 applies to her. If she was under the law, Paul said, we know that the things that the law speaks, it speaks to those that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and that the whole world may be found guilty before God. That includes Mary. We'll pick up again with the Virgin Mary at the next class, and just simply compare Roman Catholic teaching to the Bible. But you can see now, that by applying simple Bible tests, a lot of the things that have developed over the centuries don't fit the teaching of the Bible. And we measure all things according to Scripture. All right, let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, we thank you for the teaching of your Word. We thank you for its clarity. We thank you for the revelation of truth that is given to us, that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, and the entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. We ask in the name of Jesus that you continue to give understanding to us simple ones, that we would know the word of God, just as you said in your word through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus answered and said to those Jews that believe in him, if you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. As we learn truth from your word, Father, free us 
to be vessels of honor, instruments in your hands fit for your use, that we could walk before you in holiness and righteousness and in humble obedience. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you.